but we are in a moment of time right now that I don't think we recognize the prophetic implications of the times we're living in right now. When I say prophetic, some people always think future. But we're talking about, when we say prophetic, we're not just talking future. We're talking, what is God saying right now? As a matter of fact, the scripture says that your life is to be a prophetic word to the world. The testimony of Jesus, read it in the book of Revelation. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So our lives are, be, are to be prophetic words everywhere we go. You are to be prophesying by your life, how you live, what you say, what you do, where you go, in your family, your business. Our lives become a prophetic word, not a, not a pathetic word. Look at somebody and say, you're not pathetic. Just look at him and say, you're not pathetic. Look at him and say, you're prophetic. And sometimes I don't think we recognize the prophetic implications of the times we're living in because we often don't see the hand of God in history. And yet, history is his story. History is his story, and I also think we sometimes miss how the scripture applies to all generations as the Bible is an eternal book that is written for all times. I shared this with you a couple of weeks ago. Jonah goes to Nineveh. I'm going to try to be brief here because we need to spend some time praying. Preachers spend too much time preaching. I thought I'd get a good amen on that, but I didn't. You're looking at me real scared here. We do. I thought the Lord said to me a few months ago, more of you doesn't mean more of me. Less of me, more of Jesus. Less of you, more of Jesus. He's called to go to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. We remember they are the terrorists of the day. It'd be like asking you and me to go to downtown Tehran, Iran, and say, repent at the risk of your head being chopped off. He doesn't want to go, you know the story. He doesn't want to go just because he wants to be disobedient, because he understands what the Assyrian nation is going to do to Israel. They will eventually take the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity in the nation. Once the Babylonians take the southern kingdom, Israel will exist no more. I don't know if you knew that or not. In 586 B.C., Israel ceased to be a nation. It was done. The people of Israel were alive, but the nation ceased to exist, did not come back into existence as a nation again until 1948 in fulfillment of the prophetic word of Isaiah. Can a nation be born in a day? Absolutely, God can do anything and fulfill his word. But Nineveh understands that this nation is going to be, or, or Jonah understands that the Assyrian nation is going to destroy God's people. He says, I'm not going there. When you read through the book of Jonah, I want you to understand that it's not a story about Jonah. It's the story about God's love for nations. And the people that are in those nations, he gets on a boat, he tries to go 600 miles away in the opposite direction. There's a storm on the boat. As a matter of fact, the text says this. The Lord sent a great wind on the sea. Why did God send a wind on the sea? It wasn't the fault of the heathen that were on the boat. Whose fault was it? The storm was Jonah's fault. An Old Testament example of the modern day church. The Lord sends a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each, watch this, cried out to his own God. Everybody prays, folks. Everybody prays to something. Whether it's addictions, whether it's drugs, whether it's immorality, sex, whatever it is, money, power. Everybody's praying to something. And they're all praying. And watch this. This is interesting. They threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. 
they are willing to give up certain privileges and rights just to stay safe. They're willing to give up what they think is valuable so they don't lose their life. Do I need to explain that? We got to get rid of some stuff because, you know, it's okay if we give up certain privileges and rights and everything because we'll just be safe if we do that. That's what they did. They were throwing the cargo overboard at the direction of the headmaster of the boat. Now, if I have to explain that to you and what's going on right now, you have been asleep the last 10 months. Where's Jonah? Don't bother me with the details. I'm going to sleep. Remember, a sleeping church, and you're part of that church, I'm part of that church. We're not talking this church, we're talking the body of Christ. It is a sleeping church that causes people to give up their rights at the risk of losing their life. The captain goes down and says, how can you sleep? Dude, get up and call on your God. Maybe your God's more powerful than our God. You think? Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. He's in the belly of this fish. This has actually been documented in history. People have actually been swallowed. We don't know what kind of fish it was. We always tell the story as kids it was a whale. We don't know if it was a whale or not, but this has been documented in history that people have actually been swallowed by large fish and lived. So this is not a, a, a fairy tale kid's story. Jesus said as this Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. It is likely that Jonah died because Jesus is making the comparison there. And God is trying to get Jonah to the Assyrian nation, an evil, wicked nation. Let me give you a test. It's nutty in California. But believers, I feel that place doesn't need to fall off the face of the earth. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with calling out the sins of the people and governmental leaders. John the Baptist did it with Herod. But where is the body of Christ that's crying out for the sins of the leaders and people of this nation instead of saying they need to fall off the face of the earth? Let me give you another test. When was the last time you fell on your face and cried out for the soul of the Governor Cooper of this state? I don't like what he's done. I don't like it either. But do you understand that we are responsible for the souls of men and women that are in power? Oh, prove that to me. Okay, let me do that. I urge you, 1 Timothy, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks to them. Pray this way for kings, mayors, governors, presidents, prime ministers. Pray this way. For all who are in authority so we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved. Understand with me that it was God who set up a system where the unrighteous would rule over the righteous. Do we need to process that a minute? It was God that set up a system where the unrighteous would be ruling over the righteous. Why would God do that? God was not concerned with that because he knew that the prayers of God's people could fix anything that unrighteous rulers would do. Read it. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live what kind of lives? Chaotic lives. Lives full of fear. Lives full of challenge. No, so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives. God is not concerned with who's in power as long as his church will pray because we have the authority to reverse evil edicts upon people. You say, well, why, aren't, why isn't it being fixed? Why are we not living in peace? Could it be, caught, be because we are doing more whining than praying? Let me show you something I, 
I discovered, I shared this Wednesday evening. This is out of Psalm 149. This was a revelation to me. Here's what Psalm 149 says. Let the praises of God be in their mouths and a sharp sword in their hands. So be the sermon illustration. Put both hands up in the air. Okay. One is worship, one is in the word. Hold it there. Okay, don't put them down. Let the praises of God be in their mouths, okay, and a sharp sword in their hands. Worship in the word. What, 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 for what reason? Well, so we can get a blessing, right? So we can feel good. So we can come to church and we, 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 can, we can all get something from God. Bless God. Did you know there was a survey done a while back and they asked church people what's the purpose of the church do you know that over 90 percent of church people said the purpose of the church is to meet my needs can i just give you a revelation the purpose of the church is not to meet your needs the purpose of the church is to impact a world through your life that is away from god watch this hold your hands up let the praises of God be in their mouth and a sharp sword in their hands. Why do we stay in the word? Why do we worship? Here's the reason. To execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the people. Here it is. Here it is. Your worship and your word. This is the purpose. To bind their kings with shackles and their leaders with iron chains. Why do we worship and stay in the word? Because when we do that, we put in chains every evil edict that any president, governor, mayor, prime minister, whoever it is, wants to bring to people, if you and I will be worship people and word people, you put chains on every evil thing that they are declaring. Keep your head. Do you understand that? Your life is to determine what happens in the nations. Do you get that? Do you understand that? When your life is all wrapped up in you, we cannot understand that the reason why God has called the church is so that you and I can execute the judgment of God on evil nations. I don't know if we're getting this or not. This is the glorious privilege of His faithful ones. You're staring at me like I have a third eyeball. Do I have a third eyeball? Put your hands down for a minute. And I was reading last night and I saw this out of Psalm 2. Watch this. Why are the nations so angry? You ever ask that question? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord. Look at me in the eyeballs. The reason you're seeing everything going on right now, the narrative is this and that and the other thing. Everything is planned against God. Is, is my microphone on? Everything you're seeing right now in the nations of the world is a plan against the Lord and His anointed one and anointed ones. Notice what it says here. What they want to do. Let us break their chains. Break what chains? The chains that we are imposing upon them through worship and the Word. Let us break their chains and free ourselves from slavery to God. If we could get our nose out of the news media and get into God's news, we would understand that he's called us to shift nations and change nations and move the counsel and directions of evil people and government leaders into the mind and the plan of God. It doesn't matter who is in that office if the people of God will bind evil edicts through worship and the word. I didn't say that. Jonah preaches. They repent. And then, and then, you remember the story? Jonah says, I'm angry. 
Is it right for you to be angry? God says, oh yes. It's right for me to be angry even to death. You want to talk about self-centeredness? And the Lord says, you've had pity on the plant for which you've not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should have not pity in any of the great city, which are more than 120,000 persons who can't discern between the right hand and their left, the children. And even the, God's even concerned with the animals. Now watch this. We think that the repentance of Nineveh, and I shared this with you, and then I'm going to be done in a minute. Two minutes. We think the repentance of Nineveh was arbitrary. It's not so. Three years before Jonah showed up, this is documented in history, okay? You can study this and find this out. Three years before Jonah showed up, a plague hit Nineveh, which was followed by a civil war, likely as a result of disagreements of how the plague was dealt with, There's a plague, there's a civil war, followed by another plague. And then one month before Jonah came, on June 15, 1763 B.C., this is documented in history, a solar eclipse occurs over Nineveh, which is now famously known as the Assyrian Eclipse or the Bursagal Eclipse. The Jews believe that eclipses on a Gentile world were signs of impending judgment from God. Now, just let me help us understand this for a moment. Genesis 1.14, God said, Let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be, say the word with me, signs in the heavens. Okay. On August 13th of 2017, I preached to you about the blood moons and the eclipse that was coming across America on August 22nd of that year. Here's a picture of it. It would come from the west to the east. That's how it tracked. And if you remember, people were driving in our area, they were driving down to Columbia, South Carolina, renting hotels because they wanted to be, they wanted to have that 60 seconds or so of complete darkness. This is, this is what the darkness looked like in the middle of the day down in Columbia. And, and people smirked at me and he said, okay, <laughs> that, that there's, there's nothing that happened because we thought something had to happen immediately. God's signs in the heavens are to give us time. So watch this. From the time of the eclipse to the time Jonah shows up is a month, and then there's another 40 days that God says, you're done. Think about this. God is talking to an entire nation. He gave them a total of 70 days 30 days after the eclipse, and Jonah shows up and he says, you've got 40 days. He told the whole Assyrian nation, Nineveh was the capital of the nation. He says, you've got 40 days left. Think about that for just a moment. What would we think about somebody that, that got on national television right now and said, America, you've got 40 days? We think, what a nut. He says, you've got 40 days, and there is such a repentance we think the repentance of Nineveh was arbitrary. It wasn't. God, for the prior three years, through the plagues and the civil war and signs in the heavens, had prepared the Assyrian nation for repentance. Look at me. What is God doing right now? He is preparing the world for repentance if we will listen in a divine supernatural awakening. People said, oh, oh Pastor, that eclipse didn't mean anything. Okay, God gave Nineveh 40 days. He gave... Nebuchadnezzar, when Daniel warned Nebuchadnezzar, he said, Nebuchadnezzar, you got one year. Read it, the book of Daniel. One year later, the judgment falls on Nebuchadnezzar. He gave us about two and a half years before February of 2020 went nutty and a virus covers the world and churches were darkened and businesses were darkened. Listen to me. In 2024, another eclipse is going to come across America. So the first one came from the west to the east. This one is going to go from north to south. This is documented. NASA has all of this. They already planned what's going to take place in the heavens. And this is what it will look like. It will 
these two eclipses will X America. What are, you, what, what, what are you saying? If there was ever a call for a nation to repent, it's now. Some of you are doing things in secret that you shouldn't be doing. I've held on to secret things. And because God didn't say anything about it, you said, God's not looking. Many people have a religious Jesus. They, they have a head knowledge of Christ, but they've never really had a conversion. They've never had an impact of Christ in their life because when you really have Christ, things change. There's no, there's, there's no prayer life. It's a... It's a religious Jesus, not in the word and worship. It's just a, a, a religious Jesus. Remember that the heavens belong to the, the Lord, but the earth has been given to men. And he's calling us through signs. How, how does a God that's created the, the universe, how does he show what he's doing when there are many people that don't even have any knowledge of him? How does God show the world what he's doing? He does it in the heavens. Even Jesus said this in Luke's Gospel 21. He said there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and the stars. Can I say this to you just one more time and we're getting ready to pray? Some of you are involved in stuff that you don't need to be involved in. It's time to deal with the anger. It's time to deal with the greed. It's time to deal with the lust. It's time to deal with the issues. It's time to deal with the struggles. There's a clear call of God across the nation and the nations of the world and across this nation. There is a clear call from God. It's, it's very clear. The time frames are up to him, but watch this we can shift the time frames. Well, how's that? <laughs> Show that to me in the Bible. Forty days! They repent, and the Assyrian nation lasts another nearly 100 years. Their repentance shifted the time frame of God. You remember Moses? Israel's sin, the golden calf stuff. Okay, God says to Moses, I'm going to wipe them out now. And I'm going to make of you a great nation. Now, man, if God said to you and to me, I'm mad with the world, but I'm going to create a new world through you, Moses. We say, hmm, God, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good, God. God gets between, Moses gets between the anger of God and the sin of the people. And there's a nation of Israel today because one man shifted the mind of God. Think of this. Think of this. Do you realize that God very often has limited what he does on the earth to the prayers of his people? Well, God's going to do whatever God's going to do. Oh, no, 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 no. There's too much example in the Bible that when we get between God and the people, we can shift the mind of God in what he's going to do in the land. That's why church isn't here to meet my needs. God has called you and God has called me to get between him and the nations. Do you realize right now if the body of Christ in America would call out like never before, first of all and deal with their own lives and then get before the God of the universe and say God spare your people rescue us God spare this nation do you realize that whatever intent is getting ready to take place in this nation can be averted because somebody got between the people and God do, do, do you understand this you see my role is not just to do something here on a Sunday. My role is to get in the secret place with God. My role is to get alone with the creator of this universe and say, God, I know we've sinned. God, I know I've sinned.
God, I know that your anger is poised against this nation and the nations of the world, but living God of heaven, would you come and cleanse us and forgive us, God? Would you please come down and would you forgive our sins and our coldness and our lukewarmness? Do you realize that if one man can shift a nation and Israel is still existing today, Day because of the prayers of a man named Moses. Don't you think that God will listen to the prayers of his people, not just so a nation can survive, but so the souls of the people in that nation can come to an understanding of who the living God really is and into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It'd be real helpful if we'd stop being so self-focused on our singular issues and get before the Lord and say, God, I'm going to stay right here until I hear from you. God, I'm going to get before you until I see something change. God, I'm going to get before you for my family, for my marriage, for my kids, for my future, for my life, for my habits, for my addictions, for my sins. And God, I'm not leaving this place until you turn your face back back to us and something changes in the heart of the nations of the world. Let me show you what God's doing. Ash, come to the keys and bring the whole band up if you can. Let me show you what God is doing because we're living in such a prophetic moment of time. On December 21st of this year, an event is going to take place that hasn't happened in nearly 800 years. They're calling it the Christmas stars. Jupiter and Saturn come together. It'll be the closest they've been in 800 years, and that's what it's going to look like on December 21st. It'll happen after sunset on December 21st. First, it'll be the start of the winter solstice. It will be the longest night of the year. It will light up the sky. And in the middle of all that is taking place in this nation right now, in the middle of the darkness, God is saying, I'm going to bring light. God is saying, if you will come back to me, I will do something that has never been done before. I will get between your issues and your struggle and your life. I will get between the addictions. I will get between the stuff. And I will do something that has never been seen before as the world. By the way, this is God saying to Mr. Biden, no to your dark winter. God is saying that he is going to do something in the middle of all of this darkness. God is saying, I am going to bring light and nobody can stop it. Nobody can say it's not going to happen. If you think your family can't be restored, they can. If you think you cannot live for God, you can. If you think you can't conquer your addiction, you can. If you think you can't get over that nasty habit yes you can because God is getting ready to send light in the middle of darkness and do something that has never been done before in yours or my lifetime I want you to stand with me right now okay listen to me I want you to place your hand on the shoulder of somebody right now. And here's all I want you to say. I just want you to say, let light come where there's any darkness. Let's pray over the way. And I said, God, let light come where there's any darkness. Let light come where there's any darkness. I want you in your own mind right now to say, God, I, I've not, if, if this is you, I've not taken it seriously, Lord, the fear of the Lord and living for God, doing what you've asked me to do, God. 
I want you to humble yourself before the Lord right now and say, God, help me to do whatever it takes. Help me not to have a repeat of 2020 as I go into 2021. Lord, I just pray right now that you would give us authority over that which has had authority over us. Let me say it again. God, give us authority over that which has had authority over us. God, that thing that we keep bowing to, that thing, God, that we keep getting into, the idol that we keep bowing down to, Oh, God, give us authority over that which has had authority over us. God, I pray for every dark spirit that wants to rip families apart in this room. God, in this moment right now, we get between them and you right now, God. And we say, God, give them authority over that which has had authority over them, I pray, oh God. God, we're clearly hearing your voice and you're giving us time to repent, time to get it right. Give us, oh God, for wasting time. God, for not understanding the times that we're living in. For debate and cynicism and arguments and issues that won't matter in eternity, God. God and rescue us. I'm going to ask you to do something you feel like God is talking to you about any area of your life. Let's quit being afraid to get to the altar. I want you to quickly just stick, come to your seat and get out of your seat and come. And, and, and let's take some time down here. Is God talking to you about something? Is God, is God speaking to you about something right now? Would you just call out to the Lord and say, oh God, I'm going to deal with what you're asking me to deal with. I'm going to deal, deal with what you're asking me to deal with, God. I don't want that thing to have authority over me anymore. If your family's in a struggle, then get to the altar and cry out to God and say, God, it's time for change. God, we can't just be in the cycle that we've been in all of these years, God, this cycle that constantly repeats itself over and over and over and over again. Now, would you not look up here to us? Would you look directly to Jesus? And would you just take some moments and pray right now and say, God, I'm humbling myself before you in this moment humbling myself before you in this moment. Humbling myself before you in this moment, God. There's great mercy and grace being offered to the world right now. Oh yes, you gotta see it differently than 
what the narrative out there is. You've got to see the mercy of God being extended to the world right now. believe the narrative out there that's in chaos I tell you what God's in complete control he rules over it all right now he rules over it all come on and sing it to the Lord come on and you reign above it all you reign above it all over the 